of 2020. How do you help young people leaving education amid a crisis? Welcome to this seminar, which is funded by the Nuffield Foundation with whom we're working in partnership as we study the problems facing the younger generation in particular. Uh, we have three excellent panelists, Kathleen Hennehan, who is a research and policy analyst with us at the Resolution Foundation and whose report on the subject was published last week. We'll hear from her first. Then we'll hear from Professor Julia Buckingham, who is Vice Chancellor of, the Univers of Brunel University and also President of Universities UK. And they produced a very important report recently on the financial position and stability of universities during the coronavirus crisis. Uh, and then we'll hear from Tony Wilson, director of the Institute of Employment Studies, who has also produced a very important recent report, Getting Back to Work. So, and all three of them have the merit of focusing not just on the important analysis of what's happening, but also proposing policy proposals. Uh, we are also on Slido and you're very welcome to join slido.com and put in your questions for our seminar. And we've already got one question, which I hope you will, you will give your reaction to. I'd love to see your votes on this. If you were leaving education this July, which route would you try? Stay in education or join the job market? Give your vote now, and uh, after we've heard from Kathleen, then we will give the results of that first poll. Kathleen, over to you. Thanks. Right. Um, so past experience tells us that recessions naturally drive up unemployment across the population. And while the realities of being unemployed are damaging in real time, we know that the experience can scar a person's employment and pay for many years to come. Now, this is particularly worrying for young people who have a higher unemployment rate to begin with, but who also have their whole working lives ahead of them. Um, so we can get a clear sense of this by comparing the unemployment rate for young people who left during the last recession, so in 2009, and compare them against young people who left just after it in 2013. So for instance, this chart that shows as many as three years after having left education, non-graduate leavers who left full-time education in 2009, shown here in, with the red solid line, had an unemployment rate of about 17%. Now by contrast, um, their counterparts who left in 2013 had an unemployment rate of just 11%, the same number of years after having left education. Um, and although it's smaller, there's also a difference between graduates as well, with 2009 graduates having a higher unemployment rate for many years longer um, than their counterparts who left afterwards. Um, so in this report, uh, um, oops, a little bit of a delay here, sorry about that. Um, so in this report, we wanted to get a sense of just how much this overwhelming economic downturn could affect young leavers um, maybe in education today. Um, so using data from the labor force survey going back to 1992, we ran an econometric model that allows us to estimate the effect of a rise on the unemployment rate, so a proxy for wider economic conditions, upon the odds of recent education leavers being in work and on their average hourly pay for many years to come. So given OBR projections, which include a six percentage point rise in the unemployment rate over the current year, um, we find, for instance, that three years after having left education, the likelihood of a graduate leaver from this year, um, so shown in blue, um, being in work is 13% lower than their employment rate would have been absent this particular economic crisis. Um, those with mid-level qualifications three years from now, so shown in yellow, are about 27% less likely to be in work. And those with lower level qualifications, shown in red, are 37% less likely to be in work than they would have been absent this economic crisis. Um, so what about pay? Um, using that same model and those same projections, we find that, again, three years from now, real average hourly pay for graduates could be about 3% less than it otherwise would have been. Now, for um, those with mid-level qualifications, pay would be about 7% less, and for lower level qualifications, about 6% less than it would have been absent this crisis. 
Now, we also know that this specific crisis will disproportionately affect particular sectors. So sectors like transport, retail, leisure, et cetera. And that's particularly bad news for young education leavers who begin their careers in these sectors. Um, so using data from the past decade, we look at the share of education leavers who get their start in these highly affected sectors. And we found, for instance, that in the year that they left education, so year zero on this bottom access here, about 40% of employed leavers with lower level qualifications worked in, these high, in one of these highly affected sectors. More than one in three people with mid-level qualifications did, and actually more than one in four graduates did too. So with vacancies in, this, in these industries likely to be really thin on the ground over the coming years, it sort, of, it, it sort of really damages that first rung of the jobs ladder that these young people otherwise might have had. And so what can policy do to help? I think in this report, we look at two broad sets of policies. So those policies that can help young people to stay on in education for longer, so building up their skills and human capital while sort of riding out the worst of the economic storm, and also those policies that help to alleviate the worst of the crisis for young people who will be entering the labor market over the coming years. So on the first of these, we think it's important that government work to help make um, study more affordable for young people. So just one instance of this is that a young person studying for a level three or an A-level equivalent qualification on a full-time basis, um, if they're over the age of 18, wouldn't be eligible to have a maintenance loan to support, to support their living costs. Um, we think that maybe government should consider extending that entitlement to people studying um, further education or lower level qualifications, just as they do to university students. Um, but in the more immediate term, we know that today's leavers will have lost out on contact hours, on learning hours, on careers advice, training, networking, all the opportunities that you would have gotten in your last year of education. Um, and we think that there's scope to, for government to make up for some of this by opening up an education leavers innovation fund. Schools, colleges and universities could put forward bids outlining programs to offer additional teaching, additional support, work placements with local employers, etc. And we also know that we need to have some support for young people who will actually be entering the labor market this year. Um, to that end, we think government should consider some of the successes and challenges of past job guarantee systems, for example. Um, so the Future Jobs Fund, which existed over the last crisis, which I'm sure we'll discuss more during this event, um, offered unemployed young people a temporary job paid at the rate of the real living wage. And it actually tended to offer people lots of training and advice and support within that. Um, independent reviews of the program found that it actually did benefit both participants and employers, and in the longer term, reduced the odds of participants being on benefits and increased the odds of participants being in work. Um, so that's just a whirlwind through of some of the things that we discussed in the report. Uh, and it's also just a whirlwind tour of some of the policy options that government might consider. And um, the broader point is that this is an incredibly challenging time for today's education leavers, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't act quickly to develop policy that can alleviate the worst of it. That's it. Great, thank you very much, Kathleen. And uh, her report is now available on the Resolution Foundation website, Coronavirus Class of 2020. Uh, and of course, do put your questions to the panel via slido.com at hashtag Corona Class of 2020. Uh, and our analysis at Resolution has very much been that young people are particularly badly hit by this recession. And in our report, we've focused on a subset of young people, those who are leaving education, leaving school, college, or university this year. And that's a group of up to 800,000 young people who do face this acute choice, whether they really should enter the jobs market now, when there are alternatives, staying on at school, going to college, going to university. Uh, the biggest single group of them will be deciding whether or not to go to university. So it's fantastic that we're now joined by Professor Julia Buckingham, the president of Universities UK. Julia, over to you. Well, thank you very much, David. And thank you, Kathleen, for that very timely and very insightful report, which has got some really interesting stuff in it. Um, we at universities are, of course, very, very worried about the impact that COVID-19 is going to have on the job prospects of our graduates this year, but not just this year's graduates, um, also our more recent graduates who are in the early stages of their careers, and of course, those who will also graduate next year and the following year. 
And we understand that it's an incredibly stressful and difficult time for all of those students and indeed all of their families who must be very, very worried about, about the future. Um, so our top priority in the university ever since the crisis started has of course been to support our students. And firstly, to make sure that as many as possible are able to complete their degrees on time and gain those qualifications that they deserve and that they need um, to go out into the workforce. Um, many I know will be doing their exams literally as we speak and others have got them looming in the um, very near future. So I would say to any students who are listening now, work hard, um, do your very, very best to get that degree that you deserve and which will stand you in very, very good stead going forward. Now, I can't deny that the future is going to be tough, um, but what I can say is that your university, wherever you are in the UK, is here to support you. And I know all my colleagues right across the sector are doing everything they can to support the students in every way that they can. But to try and help with this, um, Universities UK has convened now a cross-sector advisory group to develop proposals to enhance the support offered. Um, and we aim to be publishing some recommendations in the next three to four weeks. Now we recognize, of course, this is a very urgent situation. Our students are graduating very shortly and they're looking for jobs now. Um, so in the time available to us, um, it's not gonna be possible uh, for the government to create a series of highly specified policy interventions but we are looking at a range of possible options of things that we can do in the immediate future. Starting with thinking about um, how we as universities um, could work together with um, businesses, um, particularly local businesses, um, to help to support students going into the job market and of course to help to support um, those businesses as well. So we are talking to our local LEPs and to other business organizations um, and very much with a place agenda at heart, recognizing that we are well um, positioned um, to work with those local businesses to help to drive the local economy. Another thing we're exploring is whether um, existing funding streams, such as HIFE, um, which is the Higher Education Investment Fund, could be redirected to help us support SMEs and local businesses by helping with their staffing issues. And of course, we also want to explore the options for further support for graduates who would prefer not to enter the job market now, but who are considering going on to do postgraduate study. Um, and we're thinking of suggesting options such as providing breaks in interests, possibly further loans, and recognizing that going on to postgraduate study is particularly challenging for those who come from underprivileged backgrounds from a financial perspective. So I think really important that we try to do everything we can um, to provide the support for these young people that they need. I think the work that the group that the UK um, have brought together has also of course helped to highlight um, the many brilliant ways in which universities are responding to the crisis to help students um, find work. And that's helping us share good practice between each other. We're not competing with one another. We are trying to do the very best we can for our graduates. Um, we know across the UK, universities, careers services are in very, very regular contact with their employer partners to try and understand what is happening. And of course, it's a moving feast and to advise our students accordingly. And they're providing a lot of additional support for students to help them navigate the job market and also very importantly, to support their mental health at a time when it is very, very challenging for them. I just give you a few examples from my own university of the sorts of things that we're doing. Um, my team are having one-to-one -one conversations with all our finalists very regularly to check up on them, to make sure they're okay, and to support them in proactively looking for jobs and advising them on possibilities for postgraduate study. Um, we've increased our digital support and we've created a dedicated web page now with online courses which are designed to help our students um, acquire more transferable skills and hopefully once the exams are over a lot of people will be logging into those. 
And of course, we're bringing employers into the conversation where we possibly can through webinars. Tomorrow, we have our first virtual careers fair, um, which will bring together students and employments to talk not just about jobs, um, but also for placements for more junior students who will be seeking to do those next year. And of course, we are working with local businesses to find ways in which our students can help them rebuild their businesses through interns and placeships and things like that. But as I said, that focuses very much on our final year students. It's very important that we also think about our more junior students. Many of our more junior students will be planning now to do placements or internships next year. That market is just as challenging as the job market is, even more so, I would say. Um, so we are looking very hard at finding ways in which we can perhaps develop more creative ways of finding work experience opportunities for our students. Um, we also need to think about students who are not quite sure what they're going to do if they're leaving school at the moment. Do they want to go to university? Do they want to fight in the workplace? Have they got an apprenticeship lined up? Well, if they've got something lined up, that is great. Um, go for it, I would say. Um, but if they're uncertain and they haven't got any, anything, I would very strongly recommend that they consider continuing their education. From a university perspective, applications are still welcome. Um, although the official closing date for the first round of applicants is in January, the last date for applying for university next year is actually in the middle of September. I believe it's the 20th of September. So don't despair. Um, there will be many opportunities, I'm sure, for you to consider um, going to university next year. Only last week, the Secretary of State announced an additional 10,000 places for the next academic year. They are targeted to certain subjects, but I would very, very strongly recommend that you look at those. So to conclude, um, while it is going to be difficult, I don't think any of us can deny um, the next few months and years are going to be tricky. Um, our universities are here to help and support our students. We will do everything we possibly can. And I think we can probably all be sure that when the economy does recover, it will be skills, um, knowledge, and capabilities acquired through education that will be the thing that will stand people in good stead going forward and will drive the economy. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much indeed, Julia, some really important points. Uh, before I go to Tony, let's just get the results from that first poll. And uh, that should be highlighted. Uh, it shows, yes, here we are, there's a big majority faced with the choice if you're leaving education, what you would do. A very significant majority saying stay in education and 24% saying join the job market. So it sounds as if some of Julia's points are getting through. Uh, now, we're going to hear from Tony, head of the Institute of Employment Studies. But Tony Wilson before that was a crucial policy advisor uh, both in the DWP and then in the Treasury as Head of Employment Policy in the crucial years after the crash of 2008. So we very much look forward to what you're going to say. Over to you, Tony. Great. Thank you, David. Um, and I was thinking about that, that um, uh, poll question myself, actually, and what I would choose. And I think I probably would be in the, in the same camp as, as the three quarters who said stay in education. Um, because it's tough and it's and it's tough in every recession um, for young people and I think it'll be particularly tough this time um, and actually after in the last recession I was just reflecting on this we went into the recession with the youth employment rate at about 60 percent and even now 12, 12 years on um, the the proportion of young people in work is 55 percent it's still lower so that recession accelerated um, what has been a long-term shift towards more young people staying in education for longer uh, and that was and that's um, been a structural change and it hasn't come back um, to where it was before the recession. I think we'll see something similar, similar now. Um, so I was just going to talk about why this is a particularly challenging time for education leavers and then talk about what I think some of the policy um, proposed policy um, recommendations might be in this space. Very much building on them. Um, Kathleen's um, ideas, which I proposals, which I which I completely endorse and agree with. Um, I think there's four sort of key challenges, a sort of quadruple whammy for education leavers right now. The first is that this is a really weak 
labour market, obviously, but with a lot of young people now actively looking for work. So already, so we have seen universal credit claims rise by more than 2 million individuals, about 2.3 million individuals since March. Now our sort of estimate would be, given that about 40 percent of um, of the onflow to unemployment to claimant unemployment is young people that that will probably translate to about um, two million new unemployed people in total and within that probably about seven hundred thousand more young people unemployed um, right now than there were before the crisis began um, and that probably means that that the proportion of young people not in education employment or training might be as high as about one in four already um, which would be higher than it was in the last downturn and youth unemployment because that's measured slightly differently could be up to about 25 to 30 percent um, already so you know scarily large um, figures um, we always talk about unprecedented impacts in this in this crisis but this, this would clearly be, um, be be one of those so so firstly this is a labor market with a lot of young people looking for work um, secondly you know we think young people Now, young people are more likely to work in um, sectors where people have been furloughed. On the other hand, they're also le um, uh, less likely, um, they're also more likely to be in, um, less likely to be in the public sector, I should say, where, um, where furloughing is less common or where, where, where in many cases furloughing hasn't been allowed. Um, so we think probably possibly as many as a million young people out of that six million group um, uh, uh, are currently furloughed and in the event that the job retention scheme winds up too quickly then we might see a second wave of job losses particularly affecting young people and that potentially coinciding with education leavers in the, in, in, in the summer um, so it could get, could get tougher could get tougher in the summer thirdly um, I, you know, I've said this before but I think recession in recessions we see job separations very quickly but then we see over the long term unemployment only comes down slowly because it takes a while for hiring to pick back up and it takes a while for unemployed people to, 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 to get into those um, get into those jobs. Now, in this downturn, we've been looking weekly at, um, at um, uh, online vacancy data and publishing analysis of that. And we think that job creation, new jobs are now running at about one third of the level they were before the crisis. Um, uh, there's about 100 odd thousand new vacancies every week. And the level of vacancies, the stock of vacancies, is, is down by about 60% on where it was before the crisis. So there's not as many jobs to get into. Right now, about 300,000. That will clearly improve as the lockdown eases, but this is a really tough um, hiring market as well. And that will particularly disadvantage young people. And then fourthly, it was great to hear um, Julia talking about how um, at her university, they're delivering online careers advice and guidance to university leavers. Um, uh, in many cases though, um, you know, the, the closure of education settings over the last few months has been exactly the time that many young people would have been getting that career support to find a next job, careers and education support to make the transition into work, to find a job, or at least the more intensive and active end of that. Um, and that's really, really concerning for me because I think it means that young people will be really struggling to navigate the system on their own, often isolated, and we know that there's going to be a gap um, this comes back to a lot of the arguments around social mobility in particular. It's going to be a gap in, um, in, uh, between those who, who, are, who are better connected to the jobs market um, from higher socioeconomic backgrounds, better able to navigate the system, and those who will be really struggling right now because of a lack of um, right, um, the right support and good quality support to find their way around um, the labour market. So there's four big challenges there, I think, that make this a really difficult time and make this summer particularly, um, particularly challenging for education leaders. So, what do we do about that? I mean, briefly, and we'll talk more about this um, in the discussion, I think, but I think um, it points to probably five priorities. The first is, critically, I think, is around helping young people who find themselves out of work or who are approaching leaving education to navigate the system. And that needs to be particularly targeted at those who are more disadvantaged. We need to be really focusing on how we can use online channels better to do that and working through services that already engage with young people and through um, in particular digital channels but critically that means working locally in partnership with local areas i think there's a tendency in a crisis to 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 uh, retrench i suppose um, and for government to feel like it needs to be doing more and doing more itself you know central government has never ever in any recession been able to do it all on its own we need to be working through local partnerships local government through colleges, training providers, higher education institutions to reach and engage with those young people to, to the right support so people can find their way around. Secondly, I think that I, I very much endorse the Association of Colleges call for a September promise. Um, and we had a similar September guarantee in sort of previous downturns to make sure 
that there's access to good quality training or education provision for all school leavers so that a critical part of that conversation in the careers and navigation piece is about what what good quality support what good quality training and education you could take up now which would enhance your ability to find good work as the crisis eases so it's not about hiding in education it's about getting uh, improving your human capital getting the skills and the training and 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 and, uh, and ideally the work related training too to make that transition when the labor market is is um is somewhat better um the third part then is around high quality employment support for those who do find themselves unemployed age quickly and early and positively to provide um, employment related support uh, when people are newly unemployed and I've talked about the evidence of this in our getting back to work report but it's really unequivocal that this works and it's almost never money badly spent um, now we have real challenges in doing that now because of social distancing uh, and because of the capacity in job center plus who've done a phenomenal job in delivering the um, in delivering universal credit and, and and managing the current crisis as those advisors are now coming back to the front line to deliver employment support we think we need to be mobilizing recruitment services in particular with about 100,000 um, recruitment you know people work in recruitment and wider employment services and charity charitable and voluntary sector housing associations local government and um, and in the private sector too um, that can be done I think relatively quickly through sort of an open but um, urgent accelerated procurement and done quickly the second aspect though is around more targeted support for long-term unemployed or those who are facing significant disadvantage um, and i do think that the future jobs fund or something like it um, is likely to be needed i do think there are some challenges there though not least because um, the lead-in times for that will be pretty long and we don't know i mean as in at least six months and we don't know exactly what the labor market will look like in six months I'm afraid I think we are losing oh, right. okay. or into training or other provision. So this needs to be part of a package of support. Um, very briefly, final points. Um, I do think we need to be really careful that we don't that we ensure that we aren't that, that young, no young people are slipping through the cracks um, in, in we, uh, as we um, as we deliver this. Um, so I got a bit distracted there as my internet connection is unstable. Um, so I'll just quickly wrap up. Um, there are about eight hundred thousand young people who were already not in education, employment, and training before this crisis began. And that figure has not come down. We, you know, that, that, that's the lowest it had been actually in about 30 years. And that's particularly explained by people with health conditions, young people with care and responsibilities and people with multiple disadvantage. So we must make sure that we're supporting those groups. And the final point, anything we do, we must be thinking about how we can make sure, make sure the system works better in the future for young people and not just emergency sticking plasters for right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Yeah, I'm afraid I think the, the signal was just a bit erratic then. Uh, we will come back to you in a, in a moment, but you, uh, you may have uh, a bit of an unstable connection. There is one radical option, which is to turn the Wi-Fi off and turn it on again. You never know. Sometimes you'll be surprised. Uh, but anyway, I'll turn back to you in a moment because some of the questions are very much up your street. But I think the, uh, but before we do that, just to remind me, we're now going to do a second poll. This is an open poll. Uh, and this is uh, asking participants in this webinar, which skills or subjects should be priorities for an education leaver's innovation fund, one of the proposals in our pamphlet last week. So that's an opportunity for you to set out your priorities. Now, we've been having a, quite a lot of questions coming in on Slido. That is fantastic. Um, and I think I'm going to turn first to Julia, because several of them, Julia, are really questions about universities. Uh, several of them, a bit of dissatisfaction, like the question from James Field, uh, paying £9,000 a year fees for face-to-face -face teaching and, and facility use. Shouldn't we have to pay a bit less for our fees given that we haven't had access to university since March? That's a, there's a strong undercurrent of feeling there reflected in some other Slido questions which I'm going to link it to. Uh, things like uh, one person, uh, young people deeply fed up about their treatment by universities. So as these are emerging in the questions, Julia, uh, what's your answer 
when you know the government is announcing 10,000 extra places, but lots of current students who are unhappy about their experience of the last few months. Well, thank you, David. I mean, without doubt, it has been very, very difficult in the last few months, and none of us would have wanted to have been in the position that we find ourselves. Um, I actually think universities have done a very, very good job in moving teaching online as swiftly as they possibly could. Um, I think Initially, of course, it was done in a hurry. I think as time has progressed, we've seen the quality get better and better and better. And certainly what I've looked at has been very good indeed. We've also had to think very hard about how we can ensure that um, end of year assessments take place. And as I said at the beginning, um, a top priority for us has been making sure that as many as possible of our graduates can graduate on time. And this is meant having to recreate our assessment processes in many instances. Um, also working very hard with the um, regulators of our um, assessment process, in particular those degrees which are accredited degrees because it's not just the university regulations that matter, it's also the regulations of the organization that accredits the degree. And these degrees of course are entries into professions. So while I absolutely agree with students, the experience has been different um, it's been very different. Um, I think the work that has gone into it on the part of the universities has been actually very, very good. Um, and my view is that if students have received the learning opportunities and they achieve the learning outcomes that they should have done, then I would not support fee rebates. I do recognize there are some subject areas where it simply hasn't been possible um, to deliver those things when there is a very, very high practical element. Um, but I think we've all had to make compromises um, and it's very sad indeed that we aren't having the summer term that we normally have. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Drew. I think I'm going to take that answer a bit forward now and ask all three of our panellists to comment on a wider issue that's again come up in quite a few of the Slido questions, which is how much innovation will we now see in the way in which education and training is delivered? Although this is obviously the virus is a disaster, Let's face it, it is also driving innovation. There are people in healthcare who says the health system has changed more in the last two months than the previous 10 years. Are there some upbeat observations about how the delivery of education and training can change for the better? I'm gonna start with Kathleen, then Tony, and then back to Julia. Kathleen. Sure. I mean, I think inevitably that there just must be. The, the fact that, I mean, just, personal anecdote um but one of my very good friends um is a teacher in the us and fifth graders which are essentially about 11 year olds um and she is actually now teaching a full day online and when this first started she thought there is absolutely no way this, this is ever going to happen um and it actually is so I, I think i think just across the educational system there probably will be some innovations i think i think that as julia rightly pointed out you know it, it will obviously vary according to the subject area um but it, it, you know, it does seem like there's potential here. Thank you. Now, Tony, um, vocational training, to what extent is that open to innovation? And let's face it, one of the most worrying figures is that, that I think eight, apprenticeship, new places in apprenticeships down 80%. If there are lots of employers who are closed or working in very different circumstances, how can we innovate in the delivery of your apprenticeships and other forms of education and training? Yeah, well, I think it's an excellent. I think it's an excellent question, and I think it's um, and I think it's uh, and it's going to be really hard. And there's two there's two things happening here. I think one is a general sort of slowdown in hiring and and huge employer uncertainty. And we know that when that happens, we tend to see entry level roles being the first to be shed. Um, that's what we're seeing in the hiring data, in the vacancy data, that it's that it's particularly lower paid jobs um, that um, that aren't being created, and employers will be. We'll, we'll be understandably nervous about creating um, apprenticeships at a time of low demand when there's high uncertainty. Um, secondly, though, clearly, like with the sectors that shut down, that's causing enormous um, enormous disruption right now and, and loss of um, loss of apprenticeships in those in those areas. Um, 
I think this, there's, there's a couple of things we can do. One is we should, I mean, we sort of said about reintroducing the apprenticeship um, grant for employers. Um, so essentially a wage subsidy. I don't think that's a panacea. I really don't think it's a panacea, but I think it's helpful if nothing else as a behavioural tool to open up a conversation with employers about, about what might be feasible in the workplace and how a bit of cash might help to, um, to ease the transition for apprentices. The second is thinking about programme-led models and apprenticeship training agency type models where an intermediary could be the employer um, in, a, in a training agency model and then um, placing people into workplaces, so removing the hassle factor for employers. We've tended to move a bit away from that over recent years and putting more power in the hands of individual employers, but I think we may need to think about moving back towards that. Again, it's not a panacea, but, but it's worth considering. The one point about innovation though, um, I think which is really worth, it, um, where I hope we'll see more is around things like um, virtual learning as well. This is a big opportunity. We've seen this a lot in, for example, construction. Sectors where it's quite hard to get people on site to do stuff if they don't have the right health and safety or the right security or the right kit and equipment. Um, Construction Industry Training Board, for example, would be a lot of interesting innovative work looking at how we can improve virtual learning um, in essentially, you know, virtual reality headsets on um, so you can get your health and safety and other accreditation. We mustn't just sort of have a, if you build it, they will come approach. We need to also be thinking about how we can engage people who are less digitally literate. Um, but I think there's real potential there, and I think this could this could be a kickstart to that because we're going to have to deal with this for at least a, you know at least a year, and doing and doing the, and, and doing things that require being on site is going to be really really hard. So I think virtual approaches are going to are just are going to become more and more important. Thank you very much, Tony. And then Julia, obviously, be interested to hear what you think about the scope for online learning. Uh, but there's one other innovation that we propose and that is being looked at, and that is someone who may be graduating now, but doesn't think they've got decent chances in today's jobs market, how feasible is it for universities, you'd obviously need changes in the financing arrangements, to offer them uh, basically an extra term, say we can provide some extra education, we can plug some of the gaps, do an extra term with us. Is that, is that if the government provided the funding for that, would universities be able to deliver it? Um, well, thank you, David. And I, I think actually, as you say, positive things come out of crises. And I think one very positive thing is the, I think it's really opened the eyes of everybody of the, to the real opportunities for using the digital world much more effectively in education than perhaps we have in the past. Um, there are, um, as Tony said, some amazing um, opportunities now in the digital world we couldn't even have dreamt of even five or 10 years ago. And I, I think people tend to think of online learning as being rather sterile. Um, but these days it is, it is highly interactive and the world of virtual reality and simulation, um, it, it's absolutely fantastic what can be done and how you can run groups of students together in different parts of the world doing the same practical class at the same time and doing it together as a team. There's some really, really exciting opportunities of things that, that we can do and we will want to do and I think we will, be, we will have to do. Um, because the reality is, as we see it, that social distancing is likely to be in place for quite some time yet. Um, so all of us in the sector are thinking about how we're going to deliver education next year and um, how we can enable all of our students, wherever they are, um, to benefit from what, what they're doing, recognising that they probably won't be able to all be on campus at the same time. Um, this may be an advantage because we know already that they struggle with the complications of trying to travel a long way each day. Um, maybe we can devise systems where they don't have to travel um, a long way each day. They can do part of their course um, remotely and then come on campus for, for other activities. Um, it will offer more flexible approaches to learning, maybe more part-time study, looking at ways in which we can upskill, reskill the adult population who of course are also affected by what's happening at the moment because jobs are being lost. But I think we need to be very careful not to fall into the trap that this is low cost and low labor intensive because it is the complete opposite. It's very, very expensive. And if you're going to do good um, online teaching, it does involve people being online and that by definition is also costly. It's not just a question of bunging something on the web, which some people think it is. Um, to answer David's question, um, I think universities, as I said earlier, will be looking at different ways in which they can support students going forward. And we'd be very interested in having those conversations. If there is the support available for the students and indeed for us to offer 
short programs for students. I'm sure that is something that many of us would be interested in, in exploring doing. And it could be, I know people think of master's degrees as one year of study, which of course they are. It is possible to get a, a postgraduate certificate or a postgraduate diploma, um, which are shorter study blocks, but still lead to a proper qualification that you can put on your CV. And I think going forward, when we think about what we call CPD, we should be thinking much more about how these programs are really credit bearing um, so that people have something that they can take forward in their life as a qualification and think about how we can build up credits over time to a full qualification. So I think lots of exciting opportunities and I'm very enthusiastic about it. Thank you very much, Julia. And I think that is indeed a vision for how education might develop in the future, more online and more micro credentials. Now, the most populous, widely supported Slido question has come from Helen Goodman, and it's about a subject which I don't think any of our panelists have yet mentioned. Uh, the first part of her question is, can we give young people the skills and opportunities to build a greener economy? So if we are looking at this as an opportunity for innovation, how does this tie in with the green agenda? Uh, and she goes on to ask about building on the experience of successful previous programs like the Future Jobs Fund. Toby, you are, Tony, you're involved in the design of the Future Jobs Fund. Uh, so let me turn to you on that question, green jobs. Yeah, that's right. So uh, yeah, so the, the, the single largest um, uh, grant that we awarded in the Future Jobs Fund was to National Housing Federation working with Groundwork UK. And they created, I think, about 6,000 jobs, maybe more, maybe it's more like 8,000 jobs. Um, uh, around kind of greening not just but a large part of it was around sort of greening the um social housing stock and doing really interesting important work in in social housing so um with social landlords so i think it's sort of two aspects to this one is how can we gear some of our supply side responses for supporting unemployed people to try to um encourage sort of good works and things that things that we think would be um, beneficial in the longer term both in terms of the skills people might benefit but also beneficial for us as an economy and as a society and doing something like I, you know I, I'm, I don't think the future job I think the future jobs fund worked at, at its time I don't think it would be the only answer by any means it was a small part of the answer 10 12 years ago but if we were to do something there's a sort of a supply side measure because it's about giving people the skills as well as the salary and the confidence and then and it's a temporary job and helping people make the transition into a permanent one then we should definitely be looking at how we can support things like um, decarbonisation the green economy that would apply too though i think thinking about um access to pre-employment training for example and the investments we make in skills more generally but that needs to be working with employers and i think again this is about local partnerships too because if you look at local industrial strategies in a lot of those areas which are looking to prioritise um, the green economy, um, you know, these, these feature really strongly in their local industrial strategies, got really clear ideas about how they would do that, but actually the, uh, sorry about in principle how they do that, but the practicalities, you know, in many cases I think need to be worked through. And this is potentially an opportunity to put some of the investment and the people behind it to make some of that work. Um, but the other, the completely other aspect to this is, should we do more to intervene more on a demand side to try to stimulate the sorts of jobs that Larger scale hiring, um, hiring subsidies and wage subsidies in those sectors. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I think there is a, there's a discussion to be had about that. I think it's going to take. There's not stuff we can resolve right now in the midst of the crisis. I think these things we need to work through in the coming months. But it's definitely an opportunity here to think differently about how we, how we try to encourage job growth in the areas that we want to prioritise. Great, thank you very much. Uh, now we have had uh, a lot of answers into our question. Uh, what are the sectors and skills you should prioritise? They are actually, some of them quite long answers. That's the danger with an open question. Um, but we, and we will try to provide a fuller account on our website. I think it's very hard to prioritise at the moment, but you can see some key values emerging like resilience and some key areas such as green skills, which you've just been talking about. Um, but I think we'll have to give you a more fuller update when we're able to analyze the uh, some of the long suggestions we've had. Um, I'm now going to turn to Kathleen because another strand that's coming through in the Slido questions, which Kathleen touches on in her report, is what is the 
benefit regime for young people. And of course, how this compares with education support. Uh, let's face it, for many young people, uh, if they're out of work, it's 95 pounds a week on universal credit is very likely to be the prospect they face. Um, compared with that, maintenance support at university might look quite good, but other kinds of courses don't provide maintenance support. Um, so there are some questions coming in, Kathleen, about whether we should review both welfare entitlements for the under 25s, but also funding of education entitlements, which you touch on the, on the report. So over to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I think that question is is absolutely dead on. One of the issues that we were thinking about when we were writing this report was that a young person, sorry, helicopter going over, <laughs> a young person who wants to study full time education um, won't be able to claim benefits whilst they're studying full time. Now, if you're studying for a university degree course, you have access to a maintenance loan um, upwards of ten thousand pounds, and obviously that is a loan that has to be paid back. There are obviously concerns that students um, will have about that when they're making their future decisions. But the fact of the matter is they will have support in the here and now to meet their living costs. One of the things that we're particularly worried about is that students um, studying outside of a higher education course. So for instance, um, someone wanting to study a level three, like an A-level equivalent course in you know, plumbing um, or electrician or, or any sort of course like that, um, won't have access to that maintenance support. Um, and that's something that we think is kind of, you know, it, 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 it's, not, it's not very intuitive when you think about it. Um, here we are in the midst of a crisis. We would think that rather than having young people sort of um, claiming benefits and not learning, we are much better served um, by being able to access um, a maintenance entitlement akin to what university students would have had so that they can study full time. So that's something that we're quite strong on in the report, I think. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the next issue is one also that comes up a lot on Slido, and I'm going to ask for brief comments from all three of you. And it's just, what about young people with other disadvantages? This, is, this crisis is tough enough for young people. It's tough if you're leaving education. Um, but if you have other disadvantaged, a disability, for example, it looks as if in some ways it's tougher for people from uh, black and minority ethnic communities. Uh, access to online learning and digital resources may be much easier if you're affluent than if you're in a low income family. So what more can we do to help disadvantaged young people who are education leavers or thinking about whether or not to go into education? Um, Tony, I'm gonna to start with you, but as we're beginning to run out of time, can I ask all of you to be brief on this one? Because I want to squeeze a couple more questions in as well. Um, so I would just focus on if I just focus on the employment support aspect of that specifically. Then I mean I think the evidence does point to um, how you can group different forms of provision together, bundles of provision uh, as as we call it. So we did a review for Youth Futures Foundation, who are funding a lot of um, uh, work in this space, um, looking at what works in supporting disadvantaged young people in particular. Um, and and a good example of this I think is actually the old New Deal program, which sort of twenty years on is getting a bit of a rehabilitation. I think, but thinking about how you can deliver really good quality, personalised and one to one support in the way that people want it at the time they want it, and and that sort of personalised and tailored to their needs, and how you put that alongside things like access to work experience, to short course pre employment training, to wider wraparound support to deal with specific things that might make work more. Difficult. Um, uh, barriers um, and then looking at things like subsidised employment for example where people can't secure and, and access to volunteering where people can't secure a job in the open market and there's quite a good evidence base about this um, I, I think it's just quite challenging to do this quickly um, but I do think we need to do it and critically I think we need to get the right systems and structures in place to do it because these have been problems for about 20 years longer and and, it, and I think part this is because of the complexity of the system for young people and the, and the unclear accountabilities and how we deliver support. Thank you very much. Uh, Julia, what about university? Access into it, support during it, more help? Because let's face it, employment opportunities for graduates afterwards also reflect prior disadvantage. Well, I think all three are incredibly important. And of course, universities have done a lot in, in the last few years to try and help students from underprivileged backgrounds to get into universities. And we've had some success, but we have still got further to go. Um, I think looking forward as the world becomes more digital and education becomes more digital, um, I think universities will have to do still more to ensure that particularly students who aren't on campus 
have access to good broadband, which is quite difficult for us to do, but also to appropriate um, devices on which to study. And one of the things I know some of my colleagues have done, and we've been doing at Brunel, is to introduce a laptop loan scheme um, so that students do have a, a good machine on, on which they can study. I, I think that is, that is very, very important. Um, looking at the job market, um, many universities, my own included, have a lot of um, systems in place already to support under, underprivileged students getting into the job market. And we take the view that um, sorting out your future career um, actually starts on day one that you arrive at university, not when you're suddenly doing your finals. And trying to build in support mechanisms all the way through um, to give those students the, the broader skills and the confidence that they need to go out into the job market. So for example, schemes like mentoring um, are very, very powerful and attaching students to a mentor in year one um, and them having that external advice to support them the whole way through are very, very positive. And there, there are many other things that we do as well, but we're going to need to do more in this environment. Thank you, Julia. Kathleen. Um, it's, this is an excellent question. Just when we were putting our report together, you know, we, we sort of, we say in the report that we focus in particular on entire on how entire cohorts of young people are affected by leaving education um, in the midst of this crisis. But actually when you dig deeper down into the evidence, we do show that actually employment scarring in and of itself is worse um, for young people um, from disadvantaged backgrounds. So you know, just take a different groups of young people, people um, on average from um, black minority ethnic backgrounds and from disadvantaged backgrounds um, economically do tend to have longer and bigger scarring effects um, controlling for a host of all other issues. Um, so it is the right question to ask. It's obviously a really big issue and it's important to take those differences into account when designing policy. I think on the employment side, um, Tony really outlined the key policies that we should be looking at. And I think Julia really outlined at the education side um, what universities and colleges could be doing right now. I think um, just thinking about the Education Leavers Innovation Fund that we proposed in this report, um, it might be the sort of thing where government lends some sort of priority to um, schools, colleges and universities that have in their bids um, provision to make sure that disadvantaged students aren't left behind and that they get extra special support, both in terms of recouping some of the learning that they will have missed out, but also tailored advice and support in the future. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Now, something else that's come up a lot in the Slido questions, and we probably haven't touched on yet sufficiently, is apprenticeships. Uh, how bad are the prospects for apprenticeships? What more can we do particularly to provide apprenticeships for education leavers? And is this yet another argument for some kind of new flexibility or redesign of the apprenticeship levy? There's a lot of resource there. How can we best use it in this crisis? I'm gonna particularly focus on, on Tony and Kathleen for this question. Tony, wh where do apprenticeships fit in? Yeah, and I think it's the right, it's the right question to, to, to ask. And I, I mentioned earlier a few, a few of the things I think we, we could explore here. I mean, I do think um, if employers do are stepping away from the delivery of apprenticeships, then we need to think about how we can try to step in to create, um, uh, to try to support apprenticeship training agencies or create new agencies along those lines and think about pro going back to the, sort of the old days of programme led models. But I think that would be, that would be a step backwards compared with having, you know, real jobs in, workplace you know good high quality apprenticeships in in workplaces I mean, apprenticeship numbers overall have fallen they've fallen for young people in, in particular with the levy and i do think one thing we need to try to do is to make sure that if we see levy numbers falling that we don't just um abolish the levy or turn it into a general training levy or whatever but just make sure that we try and keep that funding in the system and keep it focused on providing good quality employment led you know workplace training for um our ideally apprenticeships for young people but Kathleen I think you'll probably have much um I mean you're much closer I'm, I'm sort of follow your your writing on this you have much closer in the detail of what we might do yeah Kathleen um yeah I, I think Tony's exactly right you know big picture well before this crisis happened um, apprenticeships have increasingly been going to um people who are aged 25 and older um, that trend has accelerated since the apprenticeship levy and wider training reforms came in during 2017. And actually, you know, the only real areas of growth in the apprenticeship system that we had seen prior to this um, crisis were for older people. Um, the old is relatively, it's, it's a relative term here, but for apprentices 25 and older, um, at higher levels of study. 
Um, and as that was happening, you know, programs at mid and lower levels going to young people who are, you know, between ages 16 to 24 were absolutely um, just falling off the chart. So I think there is a case um, to say, yeah, we, we do need to prioritize whatever existing apprenticeships are coming through the pipeline. We do need to prioritize them for younger people, but obviously taking into account that there, there just might be fewer apprenticeships going around and those that are going around might not be tailored to someone who doesn't already have a degree. So I think to that end, um, Tony is very much in the right place to be saying that we need to look at actually developing um, programs for those young people. Good, thank you very much. Well, let me in the last few minutes just try to pull the, the threads together. I mean, I should first of all thank our panelists and it's been great to hear from Kathleen, from Julia, from Tony. Uh, and uh, all of them, all three of them have recently produced really valuable reports from their organizations as from Resolution, uh, supported of course by the Nuffield Foundation, which we greatly appreciate, uh, Julia on behalf of Universities UK, and Tony drawing on his experience producing his report at the Institute of Employment Studies. Uh, I think there are some very clear themes. Uh, one important message is equity. Sadly, our own research at Resolution shows this is a crisis which hits younger people, people on the periphery of the jobs market, it's women, it's people from ethnic minorities, particularly hard. So we always have, we don't want this to exacerbate unfairness in our society. Uh, there's a lot of interest in innovation and how we can deliver education and training differently. And that isn't just online education and training, though certainly there have been great innovations there. It can be a far quali higher quality, more enriched experience than people would have imagined. It should be more than just sticking a, a, a lesson or a course up on Zoom. Uh, so there is scope for innovation in use of online uh, education and training. There's also scope for more flexibility. We are talking about people who, if they do see a good job offer, may want to take it, but meanwhile, the opportunity of getting some kind of further education and training that gets some kind of credit, even if it doesn't require a full year in a conventionally structured course, so that the, the next few months aren't wasted. I think that's a really important area to look at. Um, we propose in our report an education lever innovation fund, really looking for local initiatives where universities, colleges, employers, can come together to design programs for education leavers. Um, and that has some parallels with the September guarantee that is also being talked about, a model really drawing on the September promise that's been advocated. And something that is a quite a handsome offer to people who at whatever stage of their education are leaving education this summer so that instead in September of signing on as unemployed, there is something for them, be it extra education or training, or some place with an employer, or some practical work experience, or as the very least, good contact with a mentor via their job center. That would be very worthwhile. And when one looks at um, all the other ways in which public resource is being allocated as we go through this crisis, we have a particular obligation to this group of highly vulnerable education leavers because our research, Institute of Employment Studies research, it all shows that the scarring effects can last three years, five years, seven years. Entering the jobs market now could well be a, a very poor deal for them. That's why I think the wisdom of our participants in this seminar was right. Three quarters saying the best thing probably for an education leaver at the moment, three quarters saying probably in some way stay on education and only a quarter saying, try to get into the jobs market now. I'm sure that is very wise advice. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us on this Resolution Foundation webinar, uh, a full report of the proceedings and particularly summary of your wise advice on the second question will be available on our Resolution Foundation website. Thank you all very much indeed.